And so I think we have two really unusual people that we wanted to get kind of out of the norm. Um, and in fact, you know, Terry, uh, I first came across you by stumbling into one of the most bizarre uses of big data visualization in terms of detecting memes before they occur. Um, having a lot to do with listening to weak signals and making sense out of weak signals. Mm -hmm. And Chris, I can easily characterize your brilliant work uh, that has now led to this incredible center uh, for, for Syria uh, at the Carter Center in terms of breaking through boundaries and thinking about new ways to listen, to visualize, and to make sense. Um, so let's start off with you, Terry, and then we'll move on. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So very quickly, I'll give you a quick overview of what we do at Sparks and Honey. We have designed a system that allows us to understand what's happening in culture, and we translate that real-time analysis of what's happening in culture into making organizations relevant in the now and in the future, right? And this is about understanding chaos. This is about complex problems, and this is about at the horizontal, um, creating patterns in order to translate those patterns into a way of staying on the pulse uh, and in the moment of where things are actually moving. So I'm going to give you three aspects of the tools that we use in order to do this. Um, the first one, which is probably the one that JSB and, and Ann both have experienced this, we do something on a daily basis which we call a cultural briefing. And what happens in this briefing is we bring together every single person in the company as well as people from the outside. And this is a time-lapse video and you see there's entrepreneurs, thought leaders, uh, CEOs, and, and all coming together at one time. We are unpacking in a one-hour period 50 to 70 weak signals that have percolated in culture in the previous 24 hours. Those weak signals are an oscillation between fast culture, things like viral videos, memes, emoji use, and slow culture, things that would impact brands over the next 36 months. That could be something that's coming out of DARPA, as we heard this morning, or out of an MIT lab. And this oscillation between fast and slow culture allows us to begin to identify weak signals in real time and then translate those signals into patterns. And the patterns happen because we do it on a daily basis. If you just did this once every two weeks, it would be randomness. But when you do it daily, you start to see little connections between things you wouldn't typically connect together. And when I talk about the horizontal, we will move quickly from the fashion industry to science to something coming out of a lab to a meme. And you would think that those things are not connected at all. But the reality is that, they, that things start in one place and they ripple across multiple industries, getting back to the interdisciplinary approach that we talked about. Um, this, this idea of constantly bringing the outside world in to allow you to unpack and, and shape those patterns is part of the process. And it is a wraparound piece to what you do with big data. The second piece, which is fundamental to making weak signals meaningful, is that you must have a framework to package those weak signals. So we have created a framework that we call our elements of culture, and it's divided into three components. Megatrends, and megatrends are things that shape culture 10 years plus, and these are things that are economic, societal, ideological. Then we have macro trends. Macro trends are things that are shaping organizations uh, three plus years out. Those could be the idea of constant connection or the sharing economy, so forth and so on. And then you have micro trends. And the micro trends are the small little signals that we look at on a daily basis. When we see enough energy around a cluster of micro trends and those fringe signals, those are what is the birthing place of a macro trend. We update these macro trends that you see here every 90 days. So it's a constant living, breathing organism of trend framework that those trends, some of them are merged together, some of them are purged out of the system, and then some of them are just nuanced over time because we become much more sophisticated about how we understand the trend itself by watching the little weak signals that are percolating in culture. The thing that we try to do with this in order to find opportunity for organizations is to understand the tension spaces. And we've talked about many of those tension spaces here today. An example of a tension space would be the idea of radical transparency. Everyone wanting to put everything out into the world of social media um, and how we use that, that data. The other side of that tension space is incognito, the idea of worrying about privacy. And that tension exists, and we oscillate between that tension. 
what we want to un understand for an organization that we're consulting with is where is the velocity moving? What's the trajectory of that particular tension space? And is there white space or a point of disruption that can be created in, in the tension space? Another example which we've talked about today is the idea of constant connection. So we live in a world that we have this fear of missing out and we want to be constantly connected to our technology. It's a leash, right? On the other side of constant connection is digital detox. The desire to break away, to find that moment of meditation and balance and not be um, a, a slave to, to tech. Those tension spaces are really um, interesting ways to explore what's happening in culture and then ultimately um, understand where behavior is shifting. So it kind of gives you a, a couple of examples. The last uh, piece, and there's many components to the um, system, but this is the idea that uh, when you're trying to understand culture, it is a rapid oscillation between data and people, data and people, data and people. It, it's that constant dance that we create between man and machine. And once we come out of the briefing and we look at those signals, whether they're mega, macro, or micro, we want to score them. This is where algorithms come in and a whole series of tools. And we score on multiple dimensions. We score on energy, how big something is in the here and now, and we score on prediction how long we think something's going to last. And for some people that we work with, they care about little micro signals and how that's going to impact what they do in the next six months. That can be very important. And that's where we talk about a meme may shift the way you talk to consumers in order to engage with them and create behavior change. On the flip side, we may identify a longer curve um, and look at that curve that's going to drive innovation. Innovation could be new product design. Innovation could be new service models. It could be brand new business models that live across the, the, the other curve. And as we do this, we're using um, three different components. We're basically going in and conducting pattern analysis on the past. So that's basically hindsight or it's cultural forensics. Then we're understanding what's happening in the here and now in real time because this system is always on. It's an always-on, 24-7 cultural intelligence system. And then from the patterns and from the here and now, we're making predictions. And those predictions become the foresight that allow us to reduce a complex world into a manageable set of opportunities. Those man that manageable set of opportunities, then, like in every decision, entrepreneurial or creative, you have to take a leap of faith. We have to then say we've used... Our brains, we've used our techniques and our algorithms to get to a subset, but we still have to have a little gut here. We still have to go on a little intuition. And then that intuition, once we make those small bets or do experiments or prototypes or pilots, the system doesn't shut off. It continues to measure the little shifts in culture to tell us how we begin to mold or shape what we're putting into market. So that's a really quick snapshot of how it works and a few of the tools. And you can ask me all the questions you want when we come back to the... Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit. Is, is this on? Is this working? Okay. Uh, talk just a little bit about what it is that we've been doing at uh, the Carter Center and the Syria Conflict Mapping Project and, and how it is we go about it. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I'll lay out very quickly the goals of the project. Um, they started out as, as simply mediation support. Um, what can we learn and what can we tell mediators to, in order to better enable them to do their job? And as we've progressed, as we've learned more, as we've collected more data, we now also do some humanitarian response. So in that context, I'll, I'll explain how some of this came about. Um, the, the Syrian conflict is very, very heavily online. It's not the first social movement to, to take place online, but I, it's the first conflict of this scale to take place online, very much online. And, and this provides uh, tons of opportunities for analysis. Um, quite a few obstacles for analysis as well, but some, some opportunities that are both shaping the way in which we can analyze the conflict and shaping the way in which conflicts play out. So to start, let me introduce you to one person. This is Lieutenant Colonel Hussein Harmoush. He was one of the first defectors. He's not the first defector, but one of the very first defectors from the Syrian military. Uh, certainly the first of his rank. And when he defected, he did so via YouTube. Uh, he's, there's a long history of, of free officers' movements in the Middle East, um, but doing so on YouTube was a new innovation for him. 
Uh, he also is, is credited in many circles with founding what we now call the Free Syrian Army or this, this broad conglomerate of opposition groups. But when he defected, he, he gave his name, his rank, his, his, he held up his ID card. Um, he gave massive amounts of information about himself in order to confirm it, in order to, to get his message out there and to, to put himself out there and, and really make this undeniable, what he was doing. And he set a precedent. He was very, very quickly followed by many other people, all doing the exact same thing. Very formulaic defections announced online. Uh, and now, by the summer of, uh, of 2012, uh, we had documented 14,000 defectors and people joining up with the armed opposition. And to, to date, uh, we've documented the formation of, of approximately 7,000 armed groups, all announcing themselves online or uh, talking about themselves, talking about the people that they're affiliated with, um, representing about 100,000 people. Now, uh, what you can do, given this heavily online conflict, is start pulling out those useful bits of information and seeing what they tell you. So with all the defectors, if everyone's giving you their, their rank and the division that they were in and where they were operating in the country, you can begin to reverse engineer the structure of the Syrian military, or at least the portions of it that are defecting. And what does that say for the, the future of the Syrian military? Is it going to collapse in any fundamental way? Is, is it going to sustain? Is it going to weather this storm of defections? What's going to happen? But then you can also look forward at what's happening with this nascent opposition force, people that are taking up arms against the government. And that's what we started to do. So this here, uh, this next animation, if it goes now, okay. This is a time-lapse uh, network diagram of armed groups that formed in the Aleppo governorate. Now, each dot is an armed group. The larger dots represent uh, larger or more important groups in the overall structure of the network. Lines represent connections between them. Colors are different clusters of connected components in this network. Now, this is just the Aleppo governorate. This is one of Syria's 14 governorates. It's the most populous, but it's still just one of Syria's 14 governorates. And it's just the first two years of the conflict. So you can imagine the, the level of complexity that we're dealing with today and on a nationwide basis. Now, I, I, before you all, you know, tweet that there are 7,000 groups in existence. Uh, <laughs> there aren't. There aren't still 7,000 groups in existence. There have been 7,000 formations of uniquely named groups that we've recorded in this way in the networks between people and the changing, evolving things. But if you really want to understand what's happening now, you can't really say that some small group that formed uh, years ago is still relevant and is still you know, a main actor. You need, to, you need to look at more of the conflict. And you can do that. Again, there are opportunities to do this online. There are opportunities in the fact that Syrian society is so heavily engaged online. Um, and we started doing that as well. So we expanded from just looking at defectors to looking at defectors and armed group formations to looking at uh, conflict events because a lot of people are posting videos and tweets and there are activist networks that are talking about these things. Um, you can also see sightings of, of weaponry, or sophisticated weaponry, weapons that were not native to the Syrian military and are therefore an indication of foreign support. And if you actively engage, instead of just passively listen to this noise and chatter coming through social media, if you actively engage with many of the actors, you can start pulling out other things, like movements of internally displaced people. You can, you can engage with people through, through Facebook or Skype and, and actually conduct surveys of humanitarian living conditions. And, uh, and, and view tribal networks uh, and how they relate to these, these armed group networks and, and other actor networks. And that's what we've done over time. Now, this, this collection of different subsets of information, which are all, again, all available online, serve to corroborate one another and supplement one another. And they can be combined to com create some very, very insightful real-time analyses, uh, such as front lines in the country. So this is, this is a map of front lines as they existed in uh, January 1st, 2014. Um, and, it, and this is, again, this is based on clashes. If you get a whole bunch of information on where clashes are happening, then, then that 
determines, okay, two forces are meeting each other there. If you get a whole bunch of information on, on where aerial bombardments are happening or when, where people are moving from because there's conflict, you can very easily determine the front lines. Those are little sonar pings and flashes of light that illuminate what's going on in an otherwise very complex situation. Um, this is what it looked like in October, October 1st, so just a little bit more than a month ago. Now, what we have been doing over the course uh, of, of this project is trying to more efficiently put all of these pieces together and analyze them in, in closer and closer to real time. Um, we were lucky enough to be, be provided for free use of Palantir technologies, which helps us keep these various databases, um, and are now close to releasing, hopefully in the next few weeks, um, a near real-time map of areas of control that automatically updates based upon um, the, the research and the, the notifications that we receive from these various sources of information. Um, now, I'll, I'll end with just by, by saying that the Syrian conflict is the first to exist in, in this really complex online space. It certainly won't be the last. Um, there's not just a, a new lens with which to view conflicts and therefore respond to them as a mediator or a humanitarian actor, but it's also fundamentally changing the way conflicts happen. The, the power that was granted to these initial defectors by just the existence of an online video sharing service such as YouTube has changed the power and in, in their capabilities in the conflict. The threshold for entry of, of a new armed group is dramatically lowered. They don't need to build up a support network. They don't need to build up financial a financial base or arms supplies or food or, or popular support or anything like that, if they are effective enough at their PR effort online, if they're effective enough online, then they can secure funding from just one or two individuals. They can connect directly to those funders and the threshold for entry has dramatically lowered. And so what, what is giving us a new lens to look at the conflict is also dramatically shifting and changing what it is that we're, we are looking at. Um, and I, I think that's a trend that will continue beyond Syria. We're already seeing similar things um, happening in Ukraine in terms of a lot of information being available online. And, uh, and we have to, I would say, as a field, begin to understand how these things are changing and what opportunities exist for analysis in order to adapt and incorporate these changes into our own processes and remain proactive as opposed to just reactive when, uh, when we see major conflicts and, and social change taking place like this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, it must have been a little bit surprising to a lot of us, um, obviously not you, that so much of this was online already. I mean, you know, um, I don't think of Syria as being a great online community. <laughs> Um, how did this come to be, or was this a surprise to you, and has it been a shock to the government, too, to see, because uh, you did this kind of independent of the U.S. government. Yes, uh, very much independent of the U.S. government. Um, this, this really was a surprise to me. Um, when, I, when I started this, this project, I was an intern at the Carter Center, and I'd right. heard of some interesting tools for social network analysis, and um, I was watching what was going on um, in the news, but I was also, you know, um, obsessively checking Facebook. We were talking about short attention spans lately. And, and realizing that uh, a lot of my friends in the region were posting some very interesting stuff. Uh, it was more interesting than what was going on in the news. And so I started trying to apply some of these, actually originally developed for marketing tools, for analyzing what's going on in social media, to the conflict and found that they were very, very effective. And, and so the, the news source was, well, it wasn't news sources. It wasn't traditional media. It was directly to the source of, of people that were engaging online. Um, and I was very surprised. There, there are actually more minutes of video of the Syrian conflict than there are minutes of real time. Um, and that's just the video. Um, so it, it, yeah, I, I was incredibly surprised. And it is, it's remarkable how, how much everyone is engaging. Now, it, it wasn't necessarily remarkable for, for all actors. Um, Facebook was illegal in Syria, 
until just before the violent conflict broke out. Right. And then it was legalized. And it wasn't legalized as a liberalizing move. It was legalized <laughs> with a, uh, a recognition that, that political activity will take place on this space and could therefore possibly be monitored. Um, and, uh, and the Syrians themselves did absolutely engage in this space and continue to, to this day, increasingly engage um, and, and share things online. So, in both of you, um, do an interesting dance between um, uh, real-time data mm -hmm. and data that's more or less static or you know, has a longer term, longer time constant to it. So, I mean, you're really looking at uh, relatively stable data sets, you know, already a month old, <laughs> um, versus the last ten minutes mm -hmm. um, or the last day. In, in your case, Terry, um, but this kind of this dance between uh, the old, the stable, and the constantly real time at this, um, that's an interesting dance. A lot of people, either they do huge data analyses, you know, Jack, a tremendous amount of your data analysis really works on fairly old data, uh, um, and the people that are doing some of the most amazing real time data aren't trying to connect it to the big old time, the static data. So the difference between real time and static data both of you are playing out in some very interesting ways. Um, um, how did you come to kind of understand that, that dance between these two? I mean, in, in our case, what we're trying to do is understand near-term change and long-term change, right? And in order to do that, um, social media, which is real-time by nature, it, and we've talked about this today, is not a good enough proxy. Right for making those, all of those decisions. So we have a combination of social media data, and we probably use some of the same kinds of tools that we're talking about here. We pull in uh, secondary research that is being conducted on different areas of focus. We even, um, which is not coming from social media, we're using proxies like what's happening on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. What are the latest patents that are, that are being produced? What's coming out of Silicon Valley? So forth and so on. And it's the aggregation of those data inputs that help us understand both short-term and long-term. The overlay to that is that we bring, bring people from the outside in. So um, where the algorithms help us reduce the number of possibilities in complexity, you need people to unpack those possibilities in real time. And so we use people in the briefings to help us do that, which you've attended. Uh, we also use platforms to do that. So we have a platform that allows people, um, and we, we think of like the curious, almost cultural anthropologists that are from around the globe to work in real time on problems that we put out. So we can... They help us identify trends that social media would never pick up. So you position people around the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, we, people are around the globe, and we tap you into those them. resources. Yeah. And those resources can identify something that's happening in Japan versus Istanbul versus South Korea and push that onto the platform, and that may be picked up way before you would ever see it pop in social media. Because for a tool in social media to pick it up, there needs to be enough volume there, right? And we're looking, we're edge-dwelling and looking for fringe signals. And then we have expert panels that allow us to uh, identify certain trends in key industries, then push them out to experts like people in this audience, but we have a, a set group of those experts that help us both validate the trends. So it's but you're looking for weak signals that ripple across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what we would tend to see, once we picked up a weak signal in one industry, we would then do a pattern or analysis. Or one country, or one culture. Could be, yeah. could, could be one city. Could be a yeah. zip code in, in the Upper West Side in Manhattan. Right. And then you want to understand where it is today, how it compares to other things that looked like that in the past, right. Right. and then how it's going to ripple across other, other industries or other cities. Right. Um, with us, it's, it's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit difficult to, to, to look at all the historic data or more established data and static data and what is happening in, in right. real time. We are, I mean, because we're, we're working with mediators and because we're working with humanitarian organizations, our focus is, is very, very much on what's happening today and what might happen tomorrow. And we oftentimes don't have the luxury of going back right. and analyzing the breadth of data that we've, we've collected before. Um, so what we've done... Is, is try to partner with as many different people as we can. Different organizations that are doing more traditional analysis of the conflict and have their own databases. Academic organizations who can, who can take a look at the database and understand it for what it is. You know, not, you know, not a total right. comprehensive database, um, but then strati statistically project out to what it would be and do more long-term analysis of, of what... Uh, 
just to give some examples of some things that we're engaging in now, what would it take for, uh, to initiate a process of disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration? <laughs> You know, that, that is not something that's dealing with today. That is, that is a much bigger problem, right. taking a look at all of the static data, of comparative analysis. And, and, and so what we, what we do is we let those people who have those capabilities do that best. And we'll, we'll keep focusing on trying to get um, better at understanding what's happening right now and what may happen tomorrow. And oftentimes they, those, those two efforts complement one another. So if we can take a look at um, historic movements of people throughout the country, internally displaced people, when they moved, what was happening around that same time, within you know, a certain radius of their towns, what conflict events were going on, then we can hopefully project forward and develop some algorithms for early warning of where, when people might move and where they might move to. Um, so that is where we're focusing, but it's very much a marriage of, of those two different things. And, and I think what, what, holds us, what, what holds us somewhat together is the notion of the, the human in the loop, like Tim O'Reilly was talking about, the difference between artificial intelligence and augmented intelligence. I think a lot of people think that because social media is out there, all you have to do is listen, and you're going to understand what's going on. What's really critical, and I don't think, I think the thing I really want to highlight is that the really extraordinary new thing is that you can listen in real time consistently, persistently over time and only when you monitor over time do you see the weak signals and the others. But it's dependent upon the questions you ask. Mm -hmm. And so the notion sure. of framing the question and the human, whether it's the experts that come in and say this is the question to ask or whether it's in, in, in uh, Syria or Aleppo. I remember when I, uh, we participated in that Aleppo workshop, the notion that you could actually create a risk landscape like, where should you travel and when can you travel in Aleppo by understanding the, the question about which bakeries are open right. and which bakeries are closed? Because if the bakery is the heart of the community and they close instantaneously because all of a sudden troops have moved into the area, and if you can create a real-time map saying, here are the three ways I can get from point A to point B, but I'm triangulating satellite images with social media saying these bakeries are open, meaning safe, zones versus these bakeries are closed, all of a sudden in real time. But you had to ask the question that it's about, about the bakery, right. right? And it has to be real time because 10 minutes later it's not, it's not relevant. So this idea of asking the right question. I in think some sense, is, visualization, of course, is a way you play with the domain in order to figure out what are the good questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I mean, I think, I think social media is a discovery tool, right? You're, we're listening, we're observing, yeah. we're um, pro applying an anthropological lens, but then it's what you do with that data. So I, I gave the example earlier. If you rewind three years ago, when we first started seeing the concept of people watching other people play video games online, mm -hmm. right? And I'll, I'll use, and, and today, that seemed, that, that's no, no big surprise. Three years ago, uh, Twitch didn't exist, and we, we observed that behavior in YouTube. And it was, and the reason we noticed it and picked up on it is because we started to see these new stars in the new new Hollywood arena emerge on YouTube. What we would do immediately with seeing that the data told us that piece of it, we then put a cultural anthropologist to journal that experience for a period of time. It wasn't probably two months after we started monitoring it that Twitch was launched. And then you fast forward 18 months after that, Twitch is sold for a billion dollars. And you fast forward to today, and you know the predictions are that esports becomes the second biggest sport in the world, mm -hmm. which is hard for people to, to wrap their head around, right? But that is the speed at which something happens. But you you use the tools in order to see the initial fringe signal. But there's a lot of people and human insight work that is done on top of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not only is it hard, but it's almost impossible <laughs> to believe it. Yeah, yeah like how, how fast it's grown, right? Right, right. <laughs> Well, right. We had to go around about this. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, you're absolutely right. You have to understand what questions to ask. And um, I'd like to say, you know, me and my team, we, we had all the foresight earlier on on what questions to ask and what things to collect that would help us answer those questions, but we absolutely did not. We just, we did a breadth-first analysis and tried to collect as much stuff as possible um, in order to see, you know, what little, like you were saying, what little things may be happening now that could become a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. So for all these, these armed group formations that we were documenting from, through, through video, we record up to 70 different attributes for them mm -hmm. um, w without any idea of which ones would be the most useful. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, when you're thinking in that way of, let's look at 
I, I, you know, it, we're, it's still very focused. We're just looking at the formations and what, what is available about new armed group formations and relations online. But taking a look at every possible aspect of it, sometimes something might come up. And visualizations, visualizations actually have been tremendously helpful in right. that. Can you give us some idea of how big is your team that does all this? Uh, for the first year, it was one. <laughs> um, th yeah, me. Uh, for the for the next year, we had a we had a team of researchers that would that were compiling the database of of you know these seventy attributes for for all these armed group formations. Um, and now it's you know it it fluctuates a little bit, but it's still very small. We still we have three permanent staff in office. We've got a, a couple of researchers in the field, maybe a total of five researchers in the field, eight permanent paid people, and then teams of interns. Um, but uh, the, the sources of, of information are, are huge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 43,000 conflict events, 7,000 armed groups, uh, several thousand weapon sightings. Um, just two weeks ago, we tracked one, the movement of 100,000 IDPs. Um, and that comes from a network of contacts that we have in the country, the, those movement assessments. But um, yeah, there's quite a bit of data to sort through. Yeah. So we have a few minutes left. Can I just bring up the Stanley thing? The, oh, yeah, yeah, what yeah. What we were talking about earlier? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what was really interesting is when Kenneth Pruitt was talking about um, the, the notion, I think he said, there are those doing the science, those doing the science can do the science, which is fantastic, right? Uh, and only those using it can say how it is to be used, like the policy makers and the commercial entities. Um, I'd like to suggest that maybe we're in a different era where actually, possibly, so we had two amazing stories of leaders that are creating change in complex systems. Um, when you're working on complex problems, that's a little bit different because it's, it's a problem you're trying to work on. I would like to suggest that the interface now may be a little bit different than those doing the science and those using the science. And um, I've had the, the fortune to kind of uh, be able to engage with Stanley McChrystal, trying to understand how he created the major change, transformation of JSOC, in that, that led to tremendous success in Afghanistan. And the moment at which he's, he put, literally, the intel guys next to, literally soldier, shoulder, to shoulder shoulder to shoulder over 24 hour periods with the ops guys. So the guys in the fields, in other words, those using the data were able to make sense of what the intel guys were seeing, but the intel guys were providing the science. So there is a suggestion, which I find really um, um, compelling, that maybe we have a new way mm -hmm. of operating where the science technologists and the people doing the leadership and the work in the can you maybe comment on that in your experiences? Because you work with the users directly, but well, you tend to supply more at the moment, right? Yeah, but, I mean, but I would say that's true. I mean, I think we're bringing together, you're, you're taking data scientists, you're taking technology experts, you're taking someone who has the expert in the industry that you're actually in, in this case you could say social sciences, right. but they can validate what you're actually seeing in those things. But you are looking at, in our case, we're looking at it at the horizontal. So we're getting, getting people out of their vertical, giving them data points at the horizontal, and then applying it back to the vertical, right? But it's that triangulation between those different disciplines right. that allow you to get to uh, something that is um, new and fresh. In fact, if I may ask, yeah, yeah, uh, Terry, your, uh, your magic hour is always one hour. One hour. Noon time, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, and half of that hour, is for the expert's report. Mm -hmm. But the second half of the hour is meant to where the imagination, intuition comes to play across the entire group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way it works is um, everyone in real time codifies what they're seeing. So they're, they're uh, categorizing to the elements of culture in real time. Everyone at the table has a different role. So it's like, it's like you come in and you're participating in the pattern identification, but everyone is doing something different at the table. When you, uh, probably 10 or 15 minutes before the hour, we then go around and look at all of the actions that we can create based on the body of work that we mm -hmm. went through that day. And we were working primarily with Fortune 500 corporations, right? So we're talking about AT&T and Pepsi and P&G and Unilever and those kind of companies. Um, and so we're translating those things that are happening in real time to something that would go back to those organizations to feed R&D, uh, innovation pipeline, or it could feed something that they put in social in the next 10 minutes. 
any of those are possibilities. And you yeah. talked about mediators and humanitarian aid. Right. Uh, so I, I, th I think one of the, one of the great um, innovations or the great things that's coming out in terms of tools to deal with this is the ability to, for, to really connect people together more easily. Um, and so I uh, spend a great portion of, of my days constantly pestering the, the doers um, you know, the, the ops guys as right. opposed to the intel guys um, in, in trying to figure out, okay, what are your decision making, uh, what pieces of information do you use for, for decision making most often? Like, what are you trying to do right now? What are your big problems? Because then we can build it into the analysis a little bit more closely. Um, and we've been able to actually directly connect into our database which develops these maps and everything and, you know, network charts. The, uh, um, the UN uh, political team, the mediators, and some humanitarians, and hopefully we're trying to get, you know, we'll be able to, in the near future, get more and more people looped directly into the system. But, um, but the question then makes it, uh, how, do we, how do we make this actionable and easily digestible to these people? Like, what exactly are those questions, and what alerts can we provide to, uh, to the stakeholders um, to better enable their, their activity and, and better seamlessly merge it with the stuff that we do in terms of the short-term analysis and the stuff that our, our partners and academics do in terms of the long-term analysis cool. as well. I think a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder point that you're bringing up is, is so critical in these worlds of complexity. Right. Um, more so than we're used to in static epistemic communities, we know the value of being shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder there, but this has a, quite a different feel to it, what I've seen. Yeah. 